Today on Real Talk, we do a lot of crying because uh, the spirit is super strong and we are discussing about how we keep God at the forefront of our minds and yeah. thoughts. And we'll talk briefly about what it means to be a godlike parent. So stay tuned. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Real Talk Come Follow Me. We're so glad that you joined us. Hi, John. Hi, Gaina Lynn. How you doing? Great. Great. We're ready for another week, diving in the scriptures. Whole new book of scriptures. That's right. Deuteronomy. I think you're the queen of giving summaries. Okay. <laughs> that's Am what I? I've decided. I think you're the only one that's ever <laughs> I given I think I'm the only one, so, so I'm a queen unto myself, there we right? Go. Deuteronomy go. means repetition of the law. Oh. So if you want to look more in the Bible dictionary, it gives a lot of good discussion on that. Mm -hmm. um, Deuteronomy contains the three last discourses of Moses, which he delivered in the plains of Moab just before he was translated, which is a really cool way to go, I'm yeah, thinking. Right. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't I've know. Never, I've never had it. <laughs> Are you one of the three Nephites, John? <laughs> Could be. Breaking here on Real Talk, no. <laughs> um, and we really understand more about the law of the Levites mm. in these books of scripture. Moses' song is his last blessing mm. and then his departure. So Deuteronomy. So much to talk so about much. if you want. Right. Yeah. This week we're not doing chapters one through three, but if you wanted to, it recounts basically mm. a repetition, right, of the children of Israel yep. from Mount Sinai all the way through the wilderness. So if you didn't catch Again, it. Again, if yeah. you didn't catch it the first time, Deuteronomy, yeah. right. second time. Which we do you. that in the New Testament that's as right. well, where we get oh, a different right. version or perspective yeah. of that. Yeah. But let's pick up in chapter six, because this <laughs> week in the assignment reading, there is a lot of chapters, six through eight, 15, 18, 29 through 30, and 34. Yeah. Um, Deuteronomy 6 is binding ourselves unto the Lord, and we see this in the frontlets mm. and on the posts. So in verses 8 and 9, it talks about taking the sign and putting it on our hand, and then the frontlets between the eyes. And then in verse 9, it talks about writing the law, mm. what we're referring to as the law here, upon the posts of the house and on the gates. And the mezuzah is, we talked about it a yeah, few weeks, the condies. Post. The condies yeah. have a mezuzah on the way out into the garage. So the fossums on your way out yes. of our gazebo. The, the minute I went to the fossum house, I was like, oh, we're going to be friends. Yeah. <laughs> because people come over to our home yeah. and they're like, what's up with that little yeah. metal box? Right. And it's for me a reminder. I don't have a binding phylactery or frontlet yeah. on my yeah. forehead, but they also... Orthodox Jews today, you'll see on their left arm, forearm, on their foreheads, oftentimes, yeah. devout Jews still practice this habit of reminding us of where the scriptures are in our lives, where is our faith in our lives. And mm. I have found that when I learn about other faiths, it strengthens my faith. And so when I'm totally. with Muslim friends and they're praying five times a day, I realize I'm praying also five times a day if I'm doing yeah. three meals and morning and night. Yeah. And so it may look different, but there's an opportunity this week. I think you have a fun activity that you do with your students. Yeah, we so phylacteries. Uh, if you just if you just Google that, yeah, look at images a lot of, of it, right? You know, it's a it's a box that they strap literally to their forehead, right? So it's 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 before your eyes, mm -hmm. you know, literally. And in that box contains prayers and things like that. And so, I'll, if you just get an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper and you cut it into strips about one inch wide, then you can uh, staple it together to make a headband. Then you can take two of them, two, and cross them, mm -hmm. and then fold them into a box, right? Mm -hmm. And so write a little prayer on there or some, you know, heartfelt thoughts, commitments to God, and make a little box about it with it and put it on that headband. I give my students the phylactery challenge. Make a commitment to God, write it in your phylactery, put it on your head, and wear it through the hallways of school for the rest of the day. And you have students that do it. I do. <laughs> they think it's so fun. Yeah. yeah. And what a great like physical reminder yeah, yeah. of an internal promise, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, speaking of like reminders, physical reminders of pro of, of, of just God in general, uh, the, I want to stick here in, Gen uh, sorry, in Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7, where God says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Then in verse 7, Teach them diligently unto thy children and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, 
when you lie down and when you rise up. So obviously these aren't meant to be taken literally all the time because I'm not going to be talking to my kids while I'm lying in bed. I'm not going to be, th- but. Unless you have teenagers that want to talk late <laughs> at night because they now always that's do. True, yeah, that's true, that's yeah. true. But what occurred to me is parents can be phylacteries for their children. In other words, parents are, should be, the reminder to their children, the manifestation of God. I love this insight that you shared. It, it really adds to this whole concept. Well, let me let me share a story. I have two stories today. Good. But we're still going to be 20 minutes. You'll see. <laughs> it's when, our goal. When I, when I was a young father, uh, we had, you know, maybe just one kid. If we had two, the second one was a baby. But uh, I was working, you know, 40 hours a week out in the sun, doing manual labor, going through school, whatever. I would come home and just exhausted, you know. And I came home one day and my son, my firstborn son, Enoch, who was about two, I guess, maybe three, he was sitting on the living room floor surrounded by toys, this huge mess, and I was just triggered. I came home and I was triggered. And I, I wanted to be like, well, I did. I barked some commands at him. I said, I said, clean this up, because I didn't want to clean it up, and, you know. So I'm like, clean it up. And he starts crying, because I was kind of stern with him, right? And I was like, I know he's crying, but I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm being a good parent. By teaching him, you clean up the messes you make. Mm-hmm. That's what I was thinking. And I might have some parents right now watching me like, well, that's right. That's what we do. Mm-hmm. We teach them to clean up their own messes. Well, I'm sort of, sort of towering over him, commanding him to keep cleaning. He's crying. I sit down, and I'm watching him. And he looks up at me, and when he looks up at me, I had a a profound spiritual experience. I wasn't even in the right mindset, right, to have an experience, honestly, but it did. The Spirit rushed into my heart, opened my eyes, and said, pay attention to what your son's about to say. It was was like, it it was almost like a smack in the face. It was so, like, uh, startling. So I listened, and he looked up at me, and he said, Daddy, sniffling, you know, will you help me clean up my mess? Sweet. And I almost said, no, you clean up your own, you made the mess, you clean it up. That's what you need to teach him. And as soon as that was about to come out of my mouth, it was stopped. It was just stopped by the Spirit. And the Spirit said, be very careful what you say next to your son, because you are a representation of me right now. And his perceptions of me, God, will be largely influenced by how you're about to respond to him now. I was so humbled by that, so taken aback. I just sort of sat back and I thought, well, what should I say? And this is what the Spirit said. What does God say to you when you go to Him? <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. Messes. When you go to Him with your life messes and you ask for help to clean up. And all these flashes, all these images of me kneeling against my bed, uh, at my bedside, begging for healing. And I just remembered every time God coming down and hugging me and, and helping me and, 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 and saying, don't worry, I got you. And I, my heart just burst <laughs> and tears started coming out of my eyes. And I just knelt on the floor and I put my arm around him and I said, of course I'll help you clean up your mess, buddy. I'll always help you clean up life's messes, and God will too. <laughs> you know, I'm like trying to overcompensate now. Like, God, lo- did you know that God loves you? And it doesn't matter how messy your life gets. He'll, you know, <laughs> All the blocks. But man, so that's my story. I have learned so much in my married parental life by thinking about one question. And this is the question I would just get us to invite us to think about. How does God parent me? Now, this requires a lot of pondering, a lot of meditation, because it's not the same. He's not here right with us physically, but he is parenting us. And if we open ourselves up to the Spirit and ask that question and meditate on it, you will have some, it's my testimony, you will have some of the most profound revelations about God, his character, our relationship with him, Mm -hmm. and everything in between. And so I just I just share that. And I need you to start talking okay, right now. Okay, so I'm going to add to that because <laughs> I think this principle of parents being the phylactery, 
right? That that season of life, Enoch was little yeah. and you got to be very clear on where he was sleeping and what yeah. he was eating and what he was doing. And the in, input you had was at a high level. Yeah. And I'm entering a different phase where my right. youngest is leaving, right? And um, I just had an experience with my son who's in a totally different stage of life where I was at home and I won't share too much, but in what he as a 24-year-old is trying to figure out, and I had a very simple prompt that led me to send something to him on text. He lives in Hawaii. Yeah. And he called the minute he got the text, which any parent of adult children knows. It's like, wait, you, you're responding so fast, right? <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like, Mom, why did you just send that to me? And I said, because the Spirit said. Yeah. And I was able to testify. I said, Mom, guess what I was doing at that exact moment? He was searching something similar. Yeah, same tip and it was me. this moment where I'm like, I, I have to trust more that God is his oh, frontlet, right. right? That I did everything I could, but I don't get to give the feedback yeah. and the input like I used to. And you were so, there long enough. Yes. And so I think as we talk about like helping our children in their, wherever they are in the path, I was sensitive to the fact that you said um, in a positive way you interacted. But there are viewers and listeners that yeah. they really do have a different experience with God because yeah. their earthly parent wasn't right. always right. gentle in the response. And so some awareness and sensitivity to the fact that sometimes you can't be the one to interject because yeah. of whatever season. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you may need to go back and realize the nature of God as a perfect parent is pro is may not be close to what you experienced on yeah. in an earthly level. Well, you just made me want to just invite our listeners to additionally consider their own experiences with their parents, like you're suggesting, mm -hmm. you know, and just consider, you know, how much of their perceptions of God is either correct right. or maybe tainted because of we're projecting. The, we're, we're imperfect as parents, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I hope my kids will constantly mm -hmm. be reevaluating their perceptions of God. Yeah. Uh, based on my successes and failures as a parent. So yeah. So should we jump to Deuter do. okay Deuteronomy <laughs> seven nine? Uh, know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. Mm, love that. I love the idea of what we were just saying that God will always keep His promise, and if you didn't have people in your life that kept their promise, that can be hard to yeah. relate to, right? Elder Bednar said, "Covenant promises and blessings are possible only because of our Savior Jesus Christ." He invites us to look to him, come unto him, learn of him, and back to the binding on the forearms and the mm -hmm. forehead, bind ourselves to him through the covenants and ordinances of his restored gospel. I testify and promise that honoring covenants arms us, right? There's the arm, right? Yeah, I like it. Yeah. With, with righteousness and with the power of God and great glory. And I would just say, I remember walking into the Oakland Temple, I've mentioned this as a 14-year-old, and feeling all of a sudden, oh, there's something different here. And if I bind myself mm. to God, and I've shared before, keeping my covenants has kept me in the weeks after Meg died. Mm. Um, I remember crawling into the temple only because I had a relationship, right. not because I left the temple for a few months there ever feeling better. The yeah. grief was so heavy. Yeah. But those covenants have literally bound me to God and he keeps his promise so I can trust that promise. Yeah. I love that. Do you have any thoughts you want to share about no, covenants? No, you just, you just made me think of, you know, he, we can always count on him. Mm -hmm. He'll never disappoint us. Mm -hmm. That's what I've learned. We can always count on him. Everybody, everyone in this world will let us down eventually. But, but not, not him. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, what a beautiful truth. Let's jump to Deuteronomy 15. We're going to talk money. Talk about the poor. Yes. Yeah. So verse 11 says, For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide mm -hmm. unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in the land. There's always going to be poor. Yes. And I would just say, Maybe it's not even financial. I think we're all poor in some way, poor in spirit, poor in connection, maybe poor in energy level, poor in your faith. Yeah. And I remember at a time being a young mom, Cameron was three years old. I was in an, my second year long bout of chemotherapy, mm. lived in this little towny townhome complex mm. where all the young moms, we would take our kids out to the common area and let yeah. them play. Shout out to my friend, Jen Mosteller, who's still my friend, mm -hmm. who, fed our family 
Every night, she just made it seem like it was normal. Like, hey, Cam, why don't you bring your parents over to my house for dinner tonight? And I was poor, but I was poor. I had no strength, and I, I didn't want my little toddler to think that I was a fun mom. I didn't want him to look back and think mom was sick all the time. <laughs> Jen Mosteller made sure it looked like it was a party every night at the Mosteller's, and she fed us a lot of pancake breakfasts. <laughs> and um, I would just say that I'm grateful for Zion experiences where yeah. people have compensated where I've been poor, and they haven't stopped to say, you could do that for yourself. They've offered it freely, what they had to give. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. This is like cry fest. I don't know what's going on. I like on today, it. I like it. We yeah, don't always don't get to have a cry fest, uh, but uh, I said right before we started taping, we're going to cry. So sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. I have another story. Okay, I was gonna let's tell. do it. I don't even know if I should. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's just so. I'm it, seeing it, it, if it, I grab just, tissue just, for you. just make me. But I mean, I. The, you know, we're, we're on this, this theme of poor, and, and I love how people step up like that and pick up the slack. And I think we need to do, a, obviously, a better job at that c communally, right? Take a turn. Take our turn, and I would say, take our turn with the beggar on the corner. Take our turn, whatever that looks like, right? And I would just ask, can we please just stop making excuses about not helping the guy on the corner? Mm -hmm. I hear so many justifications and excuses, but we can read very clearly in Deuteronomy 15. And Mosiah, if, right? If you've ever come up with an excuse not to help a poor guy on the corner, read Deuteronomy 15 and Mosiah 4, King mm -hmm. Benjamin, mm -hmm. are we not all beggars? Mm -hmm. So quit justifying and just help. We're not the motives police. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> or we don't know the backstory. Can we just help when you can help. And I, I, and I don't know what that looks like um, for everybody. And every time for me, it's different. And I don't always like sharing these experiences I'm about to share simply because most of these experiences just happen between me and God. And those are the most sacred, sacred. ones to me. No one on planet Earth knows but me. And that's so sacred. But I'll share one just as an illustration. What are we doing? What were we thinking, <laughs> you're man? Doing, what were we thinking? <laughs> anyway, so I was at the mall. Uh, we moved into our new house. I'd saved a bunch of money for furniture. So I just got, I was coming out of the mall from this furniture store, having spent thousands of dollars on furniture. One of the pieces of furniture was a super extraneous piece of furniture, a massage chair, okay? I spent so much money on, but I was so happy to have it. I'm pulling out of the mall and there's a guy asking for help. I just bought a massage chair. <sighs> Sorry. I didn't have any cash. I really didn't. But I knew I could not drive past a man asking for food when I just bought a massage chair. So I just pulled over. I said, hey, can, can, I, can I get you a meal, man? You know, like, are you okay? And he goes, oh, I'd love a meal. He's an older guy. Uh, I said, hey, why don't you meet me over at the food court? I'll let you choose whatever you want. He goes, okay. And I go to the driveway and I see he can barely walk. So I turn right back around. I said, let me drive you over there. So I drive him over. I get out, open the door, and I walk him up to the food court through the doors. I get him all comfortable, and I say, I'll be right back. I go park my car, and I come back, and I go, hey, man, you got all these choices. What do you want, you know? And he's, he's just this old man, so sweet. He said, I think I'd like some of that over there. So I go over, I'm like, what do you want on your, you know, I get to take his order, and I'm like, this is not this is nothing compared to what this guy needs. I, he needs so much more than this, right? He needs so much more, and I'm feeling so insufficient, and I go over, and I get him his tray of food. I said, what drink do you want? And he tells me, I go get his drink, and I'm, I'm just like, what, do you, what else do you need? What else do you need? And in this moment of just like heavenly clarity, he, he looked at me, he reached out, he took me by my hand, and he said, hey, so sincerely, he said, you've done enough. He said, you've done enough. Go home, thank you so much, you've done enough. And I was just flooded, man. I was flooded. It's like, it was like he's, heaven was speaking to me through him. And, and I knew I had just taken my turn. And I really felt like that was enough, right? I wanted to go buy him a house, right? <laughs> I mean, I wanted to go make sport, but, but that was enough. That was my role at that time for this man. Your stewardship. That was my, that was my turn. And um, I just think of all the experiences we have missed 
in connecting ourselves to God. Because we're not willing. Because we got all these justifications. Or judgment. Judgments. Man, if we would just let go of that and just serve when we have the chance, say what? We'd be closer to Zion today. Or Jesus, because is he not in those moments Absolutely. of exchange with the homeless person? I think that guy was actually one of the three Nephites, uh -huh. now they think about uh -huh. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it wasn't you, it was it you. Wasn't me. And in the same theme, I, I think one of the blessings that we see in Deuteronomy 29 is sometimes we think it's only about money. I mean, in yeah, that situation, yeah. you gave food. My situation, my friend made sure yes, that so beautiful. So my many different son ways. was happy every yes. day and we got fed and it didn't look like a burden. Yeah. The children of Israel were, you know, weeping and mourning because here Moses dies. And one of the blessings besides the manna experience that they were having, right, is, um, I, I'm going to get this wrong, right, is that they did not have their clothes wear out I think that's so or cool. their shoes wear out. That's so cool. And I just think about how oftentimes when we talk about tithing that we think it's like the powers and heaven's going to open and yeah. money's going to drop in our <laughs> lap. We wish. And, and I would just say, I'll testify of 30 years of marriage that the blessings of tithing in the yeah. Condi house is that our cars kept working. That's right. And right. I'm still driving it. We're yes. both driving tithing cars. Yes. And that's what we call them. And so I think from manna to these super shoes that didn't wear out, God was making sure that the wilderness experience was hard and long, but the consecration was on those simple things that they yeah. didn't have to run to Target because the <laughs> shoes were working out, right? Yeah. And I know you have, you've shared some stories uh, yeah. about your tithing cars, yeah. right? And I'm done sharing stories Okay, today. I got, I, I'm, I'm empty. You're empty. <laughs> you are empty. <laughs> and I'm going to drop all the notes because John's no. empty. I checked out. Whatever, we, whatever else we have. Okay, on the so why don't, why don't we end with an invitation, which is on you, brother? Absolutely. Our, <laughs> our invitation this week is simple. We just invite you to show your gratitude to God for all that He's given to you by serving someone else. Whatever that looks like to you, whatever the Spirit prompts you to do, we know it'll bless your life and help connect you more to the Savior. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us again next time on Real Talk Come Follow Me. Do you like Real Talk? Come follow me. Then like and subscribe. <laughs>